I never fit the mold of a real sales guy, right? Hey, Mr. Jones, if I could get this for you in red by Tuesday at two o'clock, do we have a deal? Like those words just couldn't come out of my mouth. Hello, everybody. This is Jake Stenzino, host of the Wheelbarrow Profits Podcast, here with my co-host, the multifamily mentor, the coach, the chef, the father of six, the best-selling author, the G-Daddy, Gino Barwa. Gino, how's it going? Mr. Stenziano. Hey, don't I you guess. have to hold your mic? Don't you have to hold your mic, like, you know, up close, like, yeah. Hey, man, we're, now we're messing it up here. <laughs> yeah, one, two, three, four, drop it like, uh, who the hell is just punching me? Five in the morning, crack it down, and it's my brother Pop from the barbershop. He's just, he's going Beastie Boys, but the Beastie Boys died here. So, <laughs> yeah, maybe too soon, too soon I, for that. I, 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 I guess there goes my intro. I was going to say the flip master on. We got, we got the good, the bad. I guess I'm the ugly. So I, I was called the ugly. No, so. no, no. Let's not let, at let me, all. Let me hold up both books here. I mean, everybody, I'm being totally serious right now. You need to buy both of these books. If you're a capital raiser, if you want to learn how to sell in today's economy, you don't have to sell. You have to offer the product. Here it is. Flip the script we're going to talk about today, and we talk pitched anything about three or four weeks ago. So go take listen to that show after you listen to this one. Sedzianowski, go ahead, bro. What do we got? We'll get formal with it. We'll get formal. We got Oren back on the show. Oren is a one of the world's leading experts on sales, raising capital, and negotiation. His book, Pitch Anything, is required reading throughout Silicon Valley, Wall Street, and the Fortune 500 with more than 1 million copies in print worldwide. We're keeping Ooh. it down the fairway here. We're, we're doing the thing. So without further ado, Oren, welcome, welcome back. Hey, I really appreciate it. This is the one place I like to come back to. Most places you can't, most podcasts, you can't drag me back with the, with the backhoe and a rope. <laughs> but here I'm, I'm, I'm willingly come back in the door. Thank you. So we, we keeps it real here, all right? First book, I mean, was life shifting for me because of one thing, because I always thought sales guys would be dirty guys and all. And you talk about brain and you talk about how to start the, the, the whole pitch. This flipped the script, just flipped it even more. And this whole Inception idea works wonders with my kids. Let's talk about Inception. What is Inception? And, and you know, how did you come up with the idea? I mean, really, I mean, did you just sit around and go, hmm? Yeah. Yeah. So, so basically, if you're familiar with the movie Inception, you know, the idea was to put ideas into somebody's mind, mm -hmm. right? And, and have them believe that the things that they want to do, they came up with on their own. Mm -hmm. And so what I realized is for me and the background that I come from, my parents were academics. Um, I went to engineering. I grew up on college campuses. I, I am creative, uh, and, and so I never fit the mold of a real sales guy, right? Hey, Mr. Jones, if I could get this for you in red by Tuesday at two o'clock, do we have a deal? Like those words just couldn't come out of my mouth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know why. It feels cheesy, it feels pushy, uh, and it doesn't feel like I've, I've and, and maybe that works for cars, and maybe that works for TVs, I, you know, I've never sold that stuff, but for a deal, even if the guy says yes, you know, so Jake, do you know, what do you think? Uh, if I can get you the right price, when we get the right deal terms together, I get a contract over to you this afternoon. Um, if it's to your liking, can we go ahead and, and get this going? And I'll put another 5% discount on the equity if you sign up today. And you guys say yes. Mm -hmm. What I believe is in the deal-making world, $50,000, $100,000, $5 million, whatever a deal is for you, mm -hmm. that's not enough to make it stick. And now you're investing all these cycles to come back around and resell it. Mm -hmm. Anybody who's in the deal business is familiar with this. Yeah, I had to go reclose that deal. I had to go resell it. Well, you know, it started moving away from us, right? And that is the worst thing in the world to close something and then have to go back and resell it, have it move away or not close. What I found is, when you are closing with these questions with force by pushing somebody into a corner, right, and making them feel once you're out of the room that they have been sold, it is, puts huge amount of pressure on the amount of money you can raise, the cycle time of the deals that you do close, uh, and, and the number and the conversion of, you know, pros leads to prospects to close deals. Mm -hmm. So I came up with this idea is, when somebody comes up with the idea on their own, I want this deal. I want to work with you, Jake. I want to work with you, Gino. I want to work with you, Orrin. This is my idea. 
to go forward in this deal. Those close, mm -hmm. seal, solid, locked, reliable, you can move on. Mm -hmm. You cannot run a business if it's not scalable. It's only scalable if you pitch, you sell, you close, it seals up, it's reliable, and you can move your energy to the next deal. That's scalable. Mm -hmm. Having to close deals three, four, five times in a row, it's not scalable and it's emotionally um, difficult. So that's why I came up with the idea of, the, the, it's not that I came up with the idea, it is that deals only have certainty and value and a good stick rate if the buyer goes, you know what, I'd like to do this. How do we, how do we close? You know, how do we make this happen? Mm. So the first time a buyer said to me, Hey, Warren, I, I'm in, I love this. How do we move forward? Hey, wait a second. <laughs> uh -huh. What, what the fuck is going on here? <laughs> Tell me. Yeah. <laughs> Hold on a second. Is there, oh, there's, I'm the only other one on this call. <laughs> hey, Warren. Uh -huh. You know, uh, I, I kind of, in my, in my mind, I thought about it like one of these high school teams that is, you know, that that's, uh, you know, for four years they've never, you know, scored a touchdown, right? And they get a new coach, and the coach is like, "Listen, run a zigzag and play, and you, you know, flea flicker, and you go around, you know." And they throw the ball, and the guy catches it, and they're like, "Wait a second, did we just get uh, six points uh -huh. on the board?" And and so, um, but then I started implementing this and realizing the the power. That, that there is a pathway and there are practical tools where you can come in and there's, there's no close. I think we said on our last call, hey, Orn, what's your best close? I don't know. I'm leaving. Looks like we got about five minutes left. Anything else we need to do? I love that. That's, yes. that's my close mm -hmm. is we're out of time. I have to go. Should we do anything? Wait, wait. How do we get started? Oh, funny you should ask. Mm -hmm. And so that is, to me, when – um, and, and, and I'll tell you inception sort of version zero for me. What happened is uh, guys would go, hey, Orn, I'm in, um, you know, I'd, I'd like to invest or I'd like to hire you. I go, what? Like, no, that's like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm interested. I'm like, you're interested? I'm like, fuck off. Literally, like, you should not do this, right? But I have a special relationship. I have a certain charisma. I'm older than you. Um, and, but you know, I'll be on the phone with a guy. Maybe I've met twice. Maybe we spent an hour on the phone and he says, you know, I want to hire you. Uh, I'm interested. Let's, let's go ahead. And I go, Jake, like, seriously, fuck off. Like that. Like They're trying to hire you. Right. And you shouldn't use this language, but what's beneath it <laughs> is, is important. Not I mean, it's, it's in my character. You know, I'm not swearing. I'm, it's sort of coming out of my DNA. And, and I know how to swear and when and not to do it, but, but you shouldn't do it. It's unprofessional, and I, and I wish I did it less. But anyway, it's me. And they go, wait, what are you talking about? Well, listen, we're talking about raising $10 million together. And what, you want to do it? You're interested in doing it? No way. Way too hard. Until I hear, Orn, I love you. The way you think is the way I think. The way you work is the way I work. The way you do deals is the way I do deals. I can't, I'm so excited about the opportunity for us to work together and create something amazing. I love you. Until I hear that, I'm not going to do anything because this is too hard for I'm interested. Yeah, let's do it. Are you kidding me? Mm -hmm. Right? Like you, you, you know how you get married? Yeah, you know, I'm um, based on what I've seen here. I'm very interested in the continuation of the relationship and we should, you know, pursue mutual, you know, arrangeable terms in which we co-inhabit and, you know, sort of get married over some period of time in which we're both interested in continuing life together, right? What would you hear? Fuck off, right? Mm -hmm. we're, we're this is why I'm not in sales anymore, Gino, because I didn't get an answer and yeah. I just plowed forward and we still got married. And to this yeah. day, she hasn't said anything yet, but I said, shit, this train's going, let's get it that, done. That, that's not, you know, that's not how you do it. Say, I love you, baby. Most important thing in the world to me. I'm so excited about the life that we're going to create together. There's going to be good times. There's going to be bad times. There's going to, no matter what, we, we're going to, together, we're going to do it. Mm -hmm. And that is what I have converted. And so that was version zero, right? Uh, and, and I realized that the importance of unless somebody really wants to work with you, the, the words I'm interested, let's do it, send over an agreement, don't, don't have the power to create a deal. Mm -hmm. Do you really tell them to F off here? Or you, like, give, give me a real word. Like, this is too, this is too much, guy, man. You're over the top. Guy, unmute yourself. 
Is he uh, there? Yeah. Yes. One. Oh, God's coming back. <laughs> yeah. Yes, God. God How are you, God? And, uh, and as as God, as is my testimony here, one hundred percent. Yes. <laughs> Can guys indulge me here for a minute? Again, the the swearing. You know it. Phew. Here, here's what I say. I was speaking at a conference once and uh, a woman came out. She goes, I love you. Everything you've said is, is amazing. I see all the things I've done wrong. This is now, I now know what I have to do, right? Oh, but the language. <laughs> <laughs> I said, sister, listen to me. If you, you know, and, and this was a conference. She didn't like the sister either, I'm sure. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> it was not a sister. I said, listen, your, your goal is what? To raise 10, $15 million for your real estate project. She said, yeah, definitely. You know, if you think you're going to raise $15 million from investment bankers and, and hardcore investors and not hear some salty language, mm -hmm. right? You, you need to disabuse yourself of that notion. I'm prepping you for the environment that you're going to be staying in. And she goes, oh, thank you very much. Uh, but so I was at a conference, right? Stop me if I told you this already. I don't think I did. Speaking about halfway up, uh, halfway into it, half an hour into it, a guy stands up. He raises his hand in the middle of it. And I know my speech. I've given it thousands of times to, to tens of thousands of people around the world. Like, I, I know it's funny and the jokes and it's compelling. But in the middle of it, the guy stands up and goes, I'm like, sir, you have a question? He's got his hand raised. Because there's not really the time for questions. It's time for laughing and crying and emotional. I'm in the middle of the story. Nobody else here. There's 3,000 other people here. Everyone else just wants to hear the story. But you have a question. All right. So you have a question. What's going on? What's going on with you? Stand up. He goes, ah. Oh. The language, I had to send my wife away. I said, what kind of man sends his wife away and stays around to hear more language? Like, oh, yeah. <laughs> I said, there's a language, I can't take it. And really, it's, it's not a lot. I'm not Gary Vaynerchuk, you know, once in a while, like at the end of a joke, right? Mm -hmm. But, but um, I said, look, it's a corporate event. You don't like the language? I don't know, 2,900 other people not complaining. You don't like language, I have no more language. I bet you don't watch Game of Thrones, do you? You don't even know what that is. Don't watch that. So. So anyway, uh, uh, we get through it. I clean up the language. Then there's a book signing. You know, 100 people get in line, right? And they're waiting for the book. I'm signing the books. A guy halfway back, he goes, hey, Aaron, right? Uh, he goes, fuck you. Will you sign my book? Fuck you, Tony. Right? I go, yeah, fuck you. So, so then the guy in line goes, hey, would you sign my book? Fuck you, Tom. You know, yeah, sure, fuck you, Tom, right? And next thing I come up, oh, it's John. So fuck you, John, right? You know, and, and so there was a, a um, sort of counter movement and people recognized. And so I signed a hundred books. Fuck you, Tom, Joe, Tony, Gino, Guy, Susan, Heather. Right? It was like the most amazing experience of my life. So, so um, the, the language can be used to accentuate mm -hmm. what's really going on with you emotionally. But if you... Um, but, but but you have to be careful with it. Mm -hmm. uh, Authentic versus not too. Like if that's yeah. your thing, be yourself. Right. If it's not your thing, then then don't you know don't create a an f bomb out of nowhere if it's not you. So I'm um, uh, a, a very famous uh, podcaster was interviewing me. You know he's 28 years old, millennial, right? And and he's asking me you know a couple questions and you know how do you motivate yourself? And you know, let's just call him John. I go. John, seriously, go fuck yourself with your millennial. How do you motivate yourself? But like, really, seriously, just go fuck yourself, right? And and so, guy was on the phone. It was one of his first days on the job. He's like, "What? What just happened?" <laughs> <laughs> so, when it comes, anyway, there's not a show about sparing, uh, uh, swearing, but but sparingly, and at moments where you're raising the stakes, mm -hmm. is when you can use language. You can't use language when there's no stakes mm -hmm. because it's bitter and it's cruel and it's mean and it's self-congratulatory, mm -hmm. right? But at those moments when really the decision is making made, the stakes are high, you can use language to signal something is going on here that's important. So if you want to unpack when Expand language- Expand on that though, because I, yeah. I was in sales for a long time. I never was sure. the hard close guy. And in the, what you were talking about before, hey, 
hey, Tommy, can I get a contract on this day? And like really try to force it. That wasn't my thing, but it also wasn't my thing was to ever, and I'm not saying I was like the best salesperson in the world. That's not what this is about. What I'm saying is I did not experience what you're talking about by getting a little cuckoo, raising the stakes and knowing what the result of that. I never yeah. kind of rolled the dice on that. So kind of sure. unpack that a little bit but because I'm really interested here, in your thoughts. Here's, here's what it does. <laughs> Most buyers don't understand that the call or the meeting we're on, something is going to happen. Mm -hmm. And therefore, they get to the end of the session and they go, super interesting. I'm really excited. Send me over a proposal. Take a look at it with my committee. We'll get back to you when we have some additional questions. You know, we're looking at all of our options. Okay. They don't understand that ain't going to happen on this call. Mm-hmm. So this, the stakes are, the stakes have to be raised. And when you say, Jake, listen, seriously, go fuck yourself. We're not doing that. That has meaning and it raises the stakes. So when you go at the end of the meeting, see at the end of the meeting, you cannot get anything done. And that's where people want to do everything. Mm -hmm. So what I decided very intentionally is at the end of the meeting is where I'm not going to do anything. Because nothing you do at the end of the meeting will have a meeting. effect mm -hmm. on the sale. Mm -hmm. Things you, that's why I start the sale like this. Very high energy. Very, well, not, not high energy from a charisma standpoint, but high energy from mistakes. Hey, guys. You know, and, and by the way, you, know, I don't always, you, um, you could say it like this. Hey, guys, glad everybody was here. Um, we agreed to start at 10. It's 10.01. Does anybody need fluids in or out? If not, let's roll. Here's what's going to happen. Okay. Yep. So now, oh, I'm at a professionally run meeting. Things are happening here. These guys know what they're doing. They're an expert in the business. We have a time constraint. We have an agenda without having said, oh, here's the agenda. Um, decisions are going to be made. The, the guys pitching us are going to make a decision about working with us. We're going to try and impress them enough that we have an option to buy their services, mm -hmm. right? There's going to be a back and forth. This is not a surf Jeeps on eBay kind of meeting and go, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. All right. So, uh, so, you know, so at the beginning, I might, that might be the one or two times I swear. So let me tell you what the fuck is going on here. Right. And they go, nobody who is needy, nobody who's That's chasing right. a deal, mm -hmm. nobody who is begging for our business talks like that acts like that, behaves like that. I'll tell you who acts like that, people right? Don't need you. Pe people are busy. Mm -hmm. You know, people are coming to this meeting as a favor to someone. People are coming to this meeting um, to allow us, you know, to earn an opportunity. But, but a needy, cloistering, um, newbie sales guy does not start a meeting like that. Mm -hmm. It exudes so people, confidence too. And I think that uh, can be magnetic at times. Yeah. Uh, you know, and one way to think about it, I've, I've learned, this was version zero of that. Um, I learned very on when I, when I started calls uh, for, for raising capital for real estate. Hi, John, glad we could get on the call. This is Oren. I've been trying to get in touch with you a while. You know, we're going to spend, I'd like to go over the property, tell you some of the ROI, the IRR, the underwriting assumptions, right? Um, very good to meet you. Um, you know, how's the weather over there? You know, did you watch the football game? So then I learned to start the calls like this, you know, they'd be on the call and I'd be talking to someone else. Yeah. So Jake, we got to get that wire. It, we, you know, we got to get that wire over. It's not acceptable. They haven't sent the 2 million. I understand 1.5 million is in, but we're going to close without them today. Sorry. Hey, John, are you on the line? Can you give me a second? Right. And I'd be ducking <laughs> I love it. other business. And then I go, where were we? Right. And I go, do you have any other questions? And like, well, I think you have it. Oh yeah. Yeah. We haven't got right. Okay. Look, here's what's going on. Mm -hmm. rolling start mm -hmm. as opposed to this, this um, validation seeking behavior mm -hmm. of being nice, being easy. Put being our napkins people. on our lap. Let's tuck ourselves in and get prepared for this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so now that, so that's what's behind that. Right. And try that mm -hmm. sometime mm -hmm. authentically. Don't make up a deal. Right. But, but be talking to someone else at the start of the call, give them a little window you know, into your world and that you're operating at a certain level, really doing deals, really are an expert in the space. And then you go, John, yeah, sorry, where were we? Well, we, yeah, we were just saying hello. Okay, hello, whatever, right? Go fuck yourself. Listen, here's what's going on, right? Mm -hmm. 
In, and, the book, in the book, you talk about the flash roll. So why don't, yeah. you, give, why don't you give, I wrote a little flash roll here. So why don't you give, tell the listeners well, what a flash roll is? Because I love it. I think it's one way to get your story out, a couple hundred words, bam, yeah. you should give your credibility out because this, this is really important. Let me, let me, let's, let's get into that. Uh, I think everything you're hearing here, right, mm-hmm. is, I mean, if you're new to this, you could put it in a, in a shoebox or a bucket called, this is assholery 101, okay? Mm-hmm. Put another box and say, this is guys who are operating in real estate at the highest level, doing deals, are highly active, are in the middle of deals, are closing, and, um, and, and, are, and are going through the rigors of deal making. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, and really, if you look inside a deal or a closing room, right, you're in a closing process, this is what really happens, right? You know, if, if you're doing a syndication, hey, is Johnson in? Where's Smith? Fuck, right? How's that guy now wired a million dollars? He said it was going to be in yesterday. Okay, he's out. All right. I have, you know, Steve Jones will come in with another million. He said he wanted three million, but he's in a 1099 exchange. See if that exchange is out. Okay, he's in. Yeah, tell Johnson he's out. What? Johnson's on the phone. Sorry, guy. We like we waited and waited. You said you wired, but you didn't. Fuck! I don't know. You say you wire, you wire. You don't wire, you don't wire. What can I do? <laughs> anyway, John, where were we? Like that's what inside a closing room mm-hmm. on a real syndication, real estate syndication, really looks like. So what what are you doing? Whether you do it differently or you don't, what what you're doing is you're giving people a lens into your status within the industry. Mm-hmm. Okay. And for me, and that's what we really wrote about in flip the script is status alignment. Mm -hmm. Are you a, like, are you a peer of the person on the phone? Mm -hmm. So what I am doing here is a reflection, not of me, but of the people that I work with. Mm -hmm. So when I have to speak to little ladies or we have a charity, we raise money, we have a billion dollar charity. My partner and I are working on, this is not how we talk to the corporate development officers at fortune 500 companies like hey bitch what the fuck is going on right Did you wire my- no right i need some money for the food bank <laughs> yeah. <What> the fuck <laughs> yeah, it's very- so this language and this model is to uh demonstrate to the investors that we are peers with them in the industry mm-hmm. right status alignment they ha- cannot believe you're a salesperson right? Or you're a newbie or you're a cashless sponsor, right? Or you're trying to, um, you know, put together two pieces of leverage with no equity into a real estate deal where they are the pure risk, right? Um, that, that you are their peer in the industry and the way you work is the way they work. That's what I'm doing in these behaviors is slicing through, um, the layers of social, uh, you know, um, uh, reciprocation an expectation and saying, I am your peer. I do business like you do. I use the language you use. I behave you the way you do. I underwrite deals the way you underwrite deals. Mm. I close the way you close. I expect the return for my money the way you expect the return for your money. We are peers. That is step one, right? So what, what is the way that somebody, uh, you cannot tell somebody that you're their peer. Yeah, I'm as good as you. I hear that all the time. Hey, Orrin, I'm as good as you. I'm better than you right? I do it the same way. Yeah, whatever. Let me see your pitch deck. Let me hear your pitch. Show me. Mm-hmm. So you have a couple of good stories in the book. The one is my cousin Vinny, when, uh, when uh, oh, my, so his, his girlfriend actually rolls out. And you also had one where you gave your key to a valet, a valet guy who valeted your car and he just rolled out what kind of car you had. You're like, okay, he knows about cars. He can park my car. So go through one of those stories and let people really understand it. Cause I wrote one down and I love the way it goes because you align yourself, yeah. even though you might not have the credibility, but if you can speak the language and all of a sudden you become credible, you, like you said, you just start aligning yourself with that other person. So, um, I, I was great, great analogy. So it's very interesting. Uh, I was watching and this was the, the version a zero of the flash roll, mm-hmm. right? I was watching, uh, or I was at a concert, and it was a rat concert or something like that, right? And they had the drum solo, right? And all of a sudden the lights, all the lights dim, the spotlight comes down, and it goes to the back of the stage. You're like, oh, what the fuck? There's a drummer back there? I didn't even know the band had a drummer, right? I mean, I'm the rock and roll band, it has a drummer, but, right? He's hiding back there, 
And all of a sudden, all the lights go. Everybody turns to him, right? And he starts going, boom, 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 boom. Like, you know, speeding up to as fast, you know, as, uh, as Jake's intro. And... And, and he's going, boom, 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 and dead cymbals and the drums, right? Like crazy, and this is going on for a minute, right? And then finally, you know, because you cannot keep that pace mm-hmm. as a drummer. It's a drum solo, right? And then, bum, 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 bing, hits the cymbals, and the lights go back, and the band comes back on. It's a drum solo. We've all seen it. You know what I'm talking about, right? Mm-hmm. At the end of the concert, my friend turns to me, he's like, man, did you see that drum solo? I'm like, that motherfucking lead singer and the bass guitars were out there for three hours singing and singing. And the end of the concert, did you see that drum solo? That was amazing. Mm -hmm. And I thought about it. And I thought, what are the psychological principles underneath that? Right? And and then then I thought, you know, um, in business, how does somebody know that you're an expert? Right? that you can drill down into the details of their problem, discuss a solution in very technical terms, as if at, at a speed in which, unless you had done this a hundred or a thousand times before, you wouldn't even be able to describe this thing that fast. And it's sort of the drum solo flash. All right, so I can give you an example. You should read the book for the examples there. They're very well thought out. But I give you, you know, a third example. Um, you, you, unless we talked about this before, I can't remember, but you take your car to a mechanic. Did we talk about this one? Nope. Mm-hmm. You take your car to what, what, what cars do you guys drive? What's your daily driver? I just bought an, an Alfa Romeo. So uh, a what? An Alfa Romeo. What year? Uh, just a 2020 Stelvio. Okay. Stelvio. Yeah. Cause I'm looking at a 1967 the I other love, day. I love the yeah. new cars. They get the, the new G- two doors and nice. Yeah. 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 Nice. So, so 2020 Alfa Romeo, uh, what, and what about a, what? We got a, a Range Rover and a, a Navigator. Yeah, the Range Rover. What year is a Range Rover? Uh, 16. Yeah, great. I had a, uh, I had that. The, the Sport? Uh, Range Rover Sport, yeah. Yeah, great. I had that car. So the perfect example. Uh, and so you take that, the, you're, you're, you start um, hearing a noise, right, which you heard. So you, you take it to um, the mechanic, right? It's a diesel, though. Oh, it's a diesel? Okay. Well, you hear a noise. I'm just all saying, because I think not, not, not many people have the diesel. It's a, Here's yeah. the other thing. The suspension starts act, acting funny. <laughs> I, gotcha. I have an R2, R2, <laughs> the airbags in it, right? So it yeah. starts acting funny, right? You take it down to the garage. And the garage goes, look, um, there's definitely some kind of problem here. I hear the clicking too, you know, when you open the door. And this, uh, maybe some with suspension, right? Leave it here, right? It's $350. It will tell you, we'll diagnose the problem. If you decide to get the car repaired here, we'll credit that $350 to the, um, um, to the repair. And you go, well, sounds good. Let, I'll, let me think about it, right? Talk to my wife and, uh, and we'll come back if we decide to do it. Because you didn't have a ton of certainty. You knew you, you, knew you were going to spend money, but you didn't have certainty that your problem was going to be solved. Mm-hmm. You go to another garage. Guy walks out, Heinrich, he's wearing a you know, white lab coat. He's got his name nicely printed on it. And you say, you know, it's making a noise, the suspension, you hear that click, click, click. He goes, yeah, so, you know, the first year, 15 to 16, Range Rover Sport, what happened is the factory was shut down for two weeks, right? And they resumed production on this line. You can see the ZCB in the serial number is an indication that this was done in the Stuttgart factory, which was loaned to them for Porsche, which is one of their sister companies. So before it resumed, so what they did with the airbag is they used the crossover airbags that weren't specifically, they're, they're fine, but the bearings grow out very quickly. These are the 27305 bearings, right? They use the 27303 sporadically. That's the right one for it. We keep the 303s in back. We do about 50 of these a year. Look, it's 1500 bucks. Leave it here. We'll put the right bearings in. Get the airbags reset. Reset the computer. Come back tomorrow morning at 11 o'clock. We'll have it for you. Done. Make my life easy. Thanks. I'll see you. A f- certainty. There is yeah. no chance. Mm-hmm that a mechanic could make all those details up about the problem and the solution unless, A, he's done this a hundred times his before. name is Heinrich. You think he knows. Right? Heinrich. So, he, Oren, how many people do you think in business actually do that? I mean, very few people it, in any industry do that, right? It is the thing that cements someone to your expertise. You can tell someone that you're an expert for an hour and they go away and why don't deals close? Because they don't have certainty. Mm-hmm that what you say will happen in the future really will happen. Mm-hmm. When, 
right? Th this is the fundamental problem. Uh, when, when people pitch, they either go strategic or they go tactical. Mm -hmm. Once you start going tactical, we all do. Our mind just goes in that direction. And that's what we mean by being too detailed. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, the guy's, you know, very way down in the weeds, but we don't know if he knows how to really operate the deal. Mm -hmm. The other reaction you get is, yeah, this guy really understands, you know, the space and the economy and the theory behind it, but can he really develop, redevelop and get the permit? Mm -hmm. Can he get down in the weeds? The real guys who close deals can talk about the strategy and on the pinch points or the, the areas where there's uncertainty in a deal, go way down the wormhole, get in the details quickly, come back up and continue to work the deal. Those are who, the, the best uh, real estate closers, investment closers in the world that I've seen are able to function at the high level and down to the detail. And that's what gives buyers and investors confidence and certainty that you understand the strategy and you can get down into the details. The way to get down in the details is to use one of these flash rolls. Um, and, I, and I detail, as you pointed out, a couple examples in the book that are very good that show you exactly how to do it. Now, how many people are doing it? You know, I'm now teaching thousands of people to do it, to do it and every single person is coming back going, oh my God, that worked like it's like magic. Mm -hmm. All the problems that I was having before, the objections, the questions, the, the delays are gone when on the specific areas of the de deal that are, that are feel like unknowns, I do a flash roll. You can do it a couple times in a deal. And it just gives them confidence that you have dealt with this issue, this problem, this situation a hundred times before, and you're an ex absolute expert in it. The keys to it, right, is you mm -hmm. don't say anything, no sentence that you say doesn't have a number in it. That is the key. So no numbers. And, and no, no, you hit the numbers. Everything you, you say have, should yeah. have a number yes. in it. Okay. okay. Oh, we no, understand the rubs, John. Okay. We do 30% rubs in the first week, and then we carry through 70% for the, the remainder of the year, and we typically see a you know 5% increase in our cap rates from executing that. Boom, thank you. And you don't lead with it and you don't party. You hit it when it's needed and you move on, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, and I think it's, it goes deeper, right? It's just, it goes so deep until the person's mind is triggered like, oh my God, we, I could talk is? to him about this for the next five hours. And, and he, he owns his shit. He owns it. I don't got to worry about so this. At the, this is what I tell young people. If you're, you know, people go, well, how do I get a breakthrough in my industry? Uh, you know, if you're 18 or 21 or 22, become an expert in some part of the energy, because energy touches everything, oil, you know, now electricity, um, um, EV, right? Because that's data you can easily get and be able to just talk for an hour at three times your talking rate about really um, um, critical things to the energy or the economy, right? And that will go super deep on something that is really high stakes to people. And that will give you the credibility of being an expert. Mm -hmm. So in areas where most deals have um, problems, right, or questions around them, exit cap rates, permitting, lease up rates, you know, market rates, you should be so deep in those areas and be able to do analysis on that to the point where somebody's thinking like, stop, 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 please. Okay, I get it. You go on offense. You don't answer. You go on offense. Right. Yeah. And, and so the, the tactics of the flash roll are everything has a number. You're talking probably two or three times faster than you could if you were thinking or making it up. And you talk in terms of uh, problems, you know, detailing the problems um, mechanically and numerically and talking about the solution to the problem um, in a way that it's clear that you have done this many, 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 many times. When the mechanic goes, yeah, you know, we keep the 303, four bearings out and back. We do about, you know, 50 of these a month. Um, uh, you know, I know for, you know, we've got 23 in stock. Uh, you know, it takes us about, you know, two and a half hours to strip down the suspension. We, um, you know, we get the bearings back in. We do, you know, quick road test. Uh, we reset the computer using the EEPROM 505 and you come in tomorrow morning. It'd be 1500 bucks. Be here at 1145. Done. We'll have it ready for you. Mm-hmm.
So that, that is the flash roll, uh, and it sets people's mind aside that there are areas in your plan that you're unfamiliar with and trying to sort of paper over and, and counting on their money to work out the problems. Mm -hmm. You have to, where, where you feel like your deal is soft or there isn't very good certainty for the buyer, you have to demonstrate an extreme level of competence. Mm -hmm. And so this has to be prepared in advance. Let me ask you uh, about the pre-wired ideas in the story. Yeah. I, think I think that's really important. I think the rabbi story was awesome in the book. So, I mean, you mind touching on that a little bit for yeah, us? Yeah, people are, people are just, they're, they're coming with projects that are too complicated. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, you, know, uh, you know, especially today. So, what I found is if there isn't, here, here's how I got to pre-wired ideas, the version zero. I was driving down the road. I was listening to some NPR or Scientific American podcast or something. And they were talking about cocaine, which I know nothing about, right? And they said, look, uh, most people think that cocaine is the substance that people ingest it, it hits their brain and the brain goes, holy fucking shit, here's some <laughs> crazy stuff, right? That is not, you know, never seen before, never gonna see it again, let's go bonkers. That's sort of how I thought of what it was. I don't know anything about it. Uh, but they go, listen, the reason that cocaine worked is because there are actually receptors in the brain for the chemical components. It doesn't work because the brain has never seen it before. Mm -hmm. It works because it does see it. It does see the components of it in smaller amounts, and there are receptors for it. It just super soaks the receptors with a lot of that stuff you would never see in that volume in nature. Mm -hmm. There are pre-wired receptors in the brain for cocaine, that's why it works. Not because it's this crazy, you know, thing that's been invented. I thought, wow, like, I wonder if this is the same for ideas, if there are just basic ideas. And then the, the version 0 0.1, we were in the Poconos, uh, visiting on a camping trip, visiting some family. And we walk into a cafe, like a, a diner. I don't know if you've ever been to like that, Pennsylvania or that part. I of literally it. was there last year and it was like, yeah. there was nothing. And then it was yeah. next to Scranton and I went oh, there and you're going to yeah. get me on a whole fucking rabbit trail, but we go into Scranton and I was there yeah. like 10 years before and it's right. decimated. It just got destroyed by 2008. So after a few days of being out there, I was like, we, we got to get the hell out of here. That's, this is that's like, where I was. Lake Ariel, Lake oh, Ariel, near the Poconos, right? And yeah. so we walk into one of these old school diners and there is this hardened ex-con who's the fry chef. Right. And he's got his you know, hat on and he's got tattoos on his neck and he's I mean, you know, his this guy's an ex con. If there was I mean, he's from central casting, like we're from we, we need somebody with Nicolas Cage on air con, you know, this guy. Right. And he's just flipping the burgers. He's mad at life. He's mad at the burgers. And at that time, my little boy was like maybe 13 months, 15 months old. You know, he's like just above being a sea cucumber and being a little bit, you know, animated. And the guy flipping the burger and he's mad at life and he turns around and he sees Asher and he's like, oh, what a beautiful little boy. <laughs> <laughs> and, and these two stories synced up in my mind. We are genetically programmed to protect children. You know, hardened criminal, um, uh, little old lady, grandma, it doesn't matter. We're genetically, because, what, what, and, I, and I looked into the, sort of psychology or the biology of this. And because, so you, so you guys know this, uh, human children are uh, develop outside of the womb as opposed to most animals. Like if you see a deer being born, deer gets born and he's like, hey, what's up, let's go play racquetball. And he's off and two seconds after being born, he's a fully functioning deer. Mm -hmm. It's like eating berries and running around and making fun of bears and writing in his journal and playing racquetball. Because the, the, most animals form inside the womb, they're born, and then they can function. Human animals, because uh, for women uh, to be able to walk and function during pregnancy, they, they're, you know, the way their cervix is constructed or whatever, um, the baby cannot fully develop inside the womb. So we're genetically programmed biologically to want to protect babies and small children uh, it, as a species because they cannot do anything for themselves. Right. Uh, and so that's why you see this behavior. So, so there's pre-wired things in the human biology. And so I thought, wow, 
um, there must be pre-wiring for ideas. Like we understand if you say to someone, well, you know, what's your job? Right? And they say, well, um, you know, I protect uh, firewall servers using, um, you know, um, Ajax code and I may, uh, you know, sub firewall developer for cross side security. You go, sorry, what are you? What do you do? Right? So what do you do is I'm a farmer. Mm -hmm. I'm a caretaker. I'm a, um, I'm a tradesman, right? I'm a blacksmith. These ideas have over 70,000 years been coded into the human intellect and we understand what it is. So I thought in deals, it's the same thing. When we come in with something new and novel and interesting, right? And we present it to someone, there isn't a receptor like there is for cocaine, like there is for babies, like there is for, hey, my job as a farmer for that idea to plug into. And therefore, it, it requires a huge amount of energy and cognitive work for the buyer or the investor to understand what it is you have and why it's important and how to get involved with it. So now, you know, I search for ideas that are pre-wired in the human mind to accept the idea of your project mm -hmm. and when you craft the story or the narrative um, of your of your project for those pre-wired ideas whew, it's in and now all you have to do is provide certainty that you really you know understand the space and can provide the value and and, and now you're putting ideas in the buyer's mind and creating inception mm -hmm. So when you do all this stuff correctly, at the end or towards the end, they go, sounds great. How do we get started? That's when you know you've pitched correctly. When they go, sounds great. I love it. How do we get started? But then you tell them to go fly a kite at that point. This, I'm, I'm still not that, that end piece. I still can't get my head wrapped around it. He, here's, here's what you have to, to, is nuance. When somebody says, I'm in. Are you really you in? Do not say great. You have to push them away a little bit and create some space. Then they will rush into that space to fill it until you see it happen. They say, I'm in, right? The answer to that is, I understand you're in. Everybody's in. This is, today, if you look at the market, it's the best deal on the market. I'm the best sponsor, right? And we have the most certainty for returns. Right? I understand you're in. Let me try and get you in, which is going to take me some work. Okay? Uh, I've got to, I still have to get you through credit. I still have to get you through diligence. I still have to get my broker dealer to sign off on you. Right? Mm -hmm. It's going to take me some work to fully get you in. Let's do this together and we'll go make it happen. But I'm not going to work harder than you will for your own portfolio. So I, so, so I won't do it for you, but I'll do it with you. Sound good? Sound good? Go. All right. When that they was beautiful. In, <laughs> by the way, that was beautiful. <laughs> and, and okay, well said. He, he's got the when, time inflection. He's pausing. He's giving the inference. Yes. Yeah, and right. we're going together, right? <laughs> we're How can we get there together? Beautiful. Listen. Listen. Fuck you. I, I'm, I'm not going to work harder on your portfolio than you will. All right. That makes no sense. Well, I ha right. How does that make sense? You know, for me, uh, you know, uh, if think about it, you know, for you, you're going to be getting an 8% ROI, 18% IRR in a irreplaceable location. I'm going to wake four years, pay your 15% pref, right. And then split my 20% with my four partners. So sometime in the future, I'm going to work super hard for five years on your behalf, meeting the PREF, getting the IRR, being completely securities compliant, right? And working very hard. And sometime in the future, assuming I don't die of COVID, I'm going to make a little bit of money. Happy to do it. That's my business. But there's no way you can ask me to work harder on your portfolio than you will. Why would I do that? Mm -hmm. We'll do it together. If you like that idea and that makes sense, let's go find a way to do it. Because the moment somebody says, I'm in, if you say great, the next thing they're going to say is, wait a second, 
right? Well, did, did I not negotiate hard enough? <laughs> uh, <laughs> and they're right? mentally Why? done. Or they're mentally done, yeah. Yes. I don't want to be invited to any club that I can get into. I always have that too. It's like if, if someone like, agrees to it, I'm like, shit, did we miss something? You know, I've said it to you a million times, right? <laughs> did, did we talk about Australians last time? No. I don't think so. Okay. That, so Australia, I have a lot of Australians in my program and they love pitch anything. Like I have, I have a huge Australian following because here's the problem. This is how Australians negotiate. Well, mate, uh, this is our project. We really love it. These are the numbers. Uh, you know, there's complete transparency. This is how much we're making. This is the deal. We, you, there's, if you don't like it, there's nothing behind it. This is all we have, right? This is the one. Uh, we, we, we use absolute transparency. There's no eye the sausage. This is how we do it. This is it, right? And they do that because they feel like they don't want to barter and negotiate and go back and forth. So they actually do come with their like best case offer. And we in America are like, what the fuck is this guy up to? <laughs> like I haven't seen... <laughs> What? Hey, have you seen this one before? The guy's saying like he's totally transparent, and this is his final offer. Like, what do you think he's really got? Is he just waiting for the the counter? <laughs> like, what, what's up with this? Right? Yeah. Yeah. So, so I say to the Australians, oh, and then they go, we don't play games, mate. We just say it how it is. It's transparent. We don't play games. Go, you know what you do? You play the I don't play games game. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> right. Uh -huh. And so. Um, the the that that's the problem is at least here in america we have some expectation of back and forth and when some and and when you go hey look um you know for example i just bought a truck right and when they i go hey you know whatever uh i don't want to use the numbers it's a very expensive truck um but it's you know so i go hey was it a truck or an suv it's an suv yeah okay suv uh, so I call them trucks, but SUV. So I go, Hey, would you take, you know, 225,000? Right. And they go, yeah, sure. I'll write it up, you know, send over the deposit and, um, we'll get it. I'm like, wait, wait, would you also take 218,000? Yeah, yeah. You <laughs> fucked up, man. <laughs> it's so, true. so, so that's the problem. When somebody goes, I'm in, you go, great. It's in. I'll write it up. They go that things that seem too easy are too easy for a reason. Mm-hmm. And so when somebody says I'm in, it's uh, you, in order to maintain, think about, let me get rid of this complexity. What happens is in order to really run a sale, you have to maintain discipline on framing, frame control, deal control, client control, pricing, information. No good deed goes unpunished when you're doing a deal. Okay. So can we agree on that? There's like yes. discipline you have to maintain, right? Mm -hmm. So when they go, Hey, we'll do the deal. But if you give us a 10% discount, you go, Hey, listen, it's a PPM. Legally, it cannot be changed. Everybody has to get the same deal. It's this deal or none. I'm sorry. Okay. Mm -hmm. the, the discipline of that. Cause if you let that go, then you've got a negotiator. So you've got to maintain discipline all the way through the deal. Then what happens is the guy goes, I'm in and people are like, fuck, ah! you know what? We got it's a done deal, right? And all discipline goes out the window because you've reached your accomplishment, your, your, you know, your goal or your target, which is the yes. The reality is that is, I don't know, you can call it two thirds of a way through the deal. Once they say I'm in, you've got to maintain discipline for the next 20 or 30 steps because there's, there's a difference between I'm in to I've signed the agreement to I've wired the money and believe it or not, there's a step after I've wired the money, which is we got the money, right? Mm -hmm. I love this. The guy goes, I wired the money. I go, great. Um, what's the Fed reference number? I'm like, well, the, um, you know, the, my bank is going to send it to me later. No, motherfucker. Like, you don't go to U FedEx and send a package. You go, what's the, what's the tracking number? Oh, FedEx is going to email it to me later. No, it's on your receipt. Mm -hmm. FedEx doesn't ship something without giving you a tracking number. The Fed does not wire money without giving you a tracking number at the moment they wire. They will mail it to you later. This money hasn't been wired. Anyway, that's, we could have a whole uh, a session on wiring. But ultimately, what the point is, once they say I'm in, you've got to maintain discipline. And part of that discipline is saying, okay, that's a good step forward, right? Mm -hmm. You're in. 
right? Now there's some work I have to do to allow you to be in. I'm glad you want to be in. Of course you want to be in. Everybody wants to be in. And then we continue with that pathway. You don't want to, you're going to close them again. That's the problem. You're going to be closing them again, like you said before, if you don't maintain that discipline, correct? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Because, because the last, once somebody uh, believes that they are in and have you, but they haven't sent the money yet, they're going to look for a better deal Mm -hmm. um, or they're going to search for negatives about you, you know, Mm -hmm. through second guessing buyers or more, they're going to look for, for negatives, uh, about you online, they're going to look at other deals. Um, they're going to start questioning it, and so that is the discipline of saying, "Hey, I'm not letting you in yet." Makes them continue to want to be in the deal. Mm-hmm. The second you allow, th- there has to be a very close proximity between, "Yes, you're in," and "Wire the money or you're out." If there's a big gap between "Yes, you're in" and "Wire the money." There's a very, uh, beto- think about it this way, between the dock and the ship lie many a slip. Mm-hmm. So, so, you know, just because the ship is next to the dock doesn't mean it's docked, mm-hmm. in other words. Yep. Or between the cup and the lip, you know, lie many a slip. Um, if, if anybody- That's why 50% who- of commitments is, is usually, you know, if you say, oh, we got a, you know, $10 Soft, million yes. commit and then you, you mm-hmm. pull through five, mm-hmm. right? That's exactly yeah. the reason. Yeah. 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 So, so, uh, that is what flip the script is really written to do is to provide the scripts that fill these gaps between a buyer, not being certain between a buyer, not understanding between the stakes, not being high enough and the buyer, not understanding how to buy from you and what you're willing to do and what you're not willing to do. And once you apply discipline to all of those areas with scripts that I provided, then they go, how do we get started? Mm-hmm. Love and that. that is my story. So Jake, I'm going to try to really wrap this thing up and just give a little brief. I think we've been talking about flip the script, but I, and we've been talking about babies, women's services, ex-cons, Range Rovers, Australians, what, what have I missed here? We haven't got to the little boy voice yet. That was my thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That. I mean, there's a lot of stuff we talked about. I got about. another question for him, Gina, if we can get oh. this. I was actually, you know, I, you know here's the Shoot thing. I, I, there, I've bro. never pitched a billionaire. I don't know if you have. But if you have, is there a difference you see pitching the big boys, you know, out there than, you know, you maybe typical you know, millionaires? And, Absolutely. And what, yeah. what is that? I have... I mean, we, I think we have to do another podcast about billionaires. I've worked with a lot of billionaires. I worked for a billionaire for a year in Beverly Hills. Mm-hmm. Quick story, and let's finish up on this. And I think this highlights the difference. My second day on the job, 9665 Wilshire Boulevard. Park my car uh, in civilian parking, you know, walk to the building. And, and you know, if you've been to Beverly Hills, it's, this is on Rodeo Drive. Uh, and underneath it's, you know... Porsche, Ferrari, Rolls Royce, Ranger. I mean, it's it's Beverly Hills proper. I go up. I, you know, I go to my office in this little. It's just a little suite, five offices. Just me, the billionaire, the COO, the guy who hired me, and the secretary, and that's it. That's my office. Uh, and I'm in there working. A second day on the job, and the billionaire goes. And I've written about him in my book, so it's not hard to guess who he is. The billionaire goes, "Come on, let's go to lunch." So we go down. And uh, we pass the Ferraris, we pass the Porsches, we pass the Rolls Royces, and we get in a uh, um, 12, 15-year-old Cadillac, right? And that should have been my first clue. I'm like, yeah, I'm going to lunch with a billionaire. What secret sushi, you know, spot where the, they, the chef doesn't even, there's no menu. The chef just comes down and looks in your eye and, and, and assesses you, and decides what you want, and dish after dish comes out, and this, this is it. I have arrived. So we get in the uh, we get in the Cadillac and we take a left um, out onto South Beverly Drive. And we drive south, right, and we pass Wilshire. I'm like, oh, then now we're out of Beverly Hills. And then we continue driving south. We pass Olympic, right. I'm like, well, okay, what secret spot is this? This is even getting more intriguing and amazing. And then we pass Pico, and if you've been south of Pico in uh, south of Beverly Hills in Los Angeles, this is now like a pretty rough area, right. And we pull into a strip mall. You know, where there's just like, um, you know, a, a Chinese grocer and a liquor store and, and cash your check here, right? That's and maybe so two liquor stores, yeah. bagel shop, a falafel shop, and a Chinese restaurant. I'm like, oh, this is getting like 
super underground billionaire, <laughs> right? I mean, there's probably, we're probably going to go down the elevator and there'll be like airplanes in a hangar, you know, underneath the city of Los Angeles. So we walk in and this is a 99 cent, you know, per meal strip mall. Like there's nothing on the menu I was willing to eat. You know, f the fried, the, like the, the fattiest foods from a Chinese menu, um, uh, fried again, probably yesterday and just reheated in the microwave, right? Mm -hmm. and, and so wh what I learned from this and the other billionaires is that these guys would go to the mat over a hundred dollars, right? You're like, what, what sense is it? You'll have multiple billions of dollars. This is not even the interest on two seconds of your time. Because once you get to the billionaires, the ones that I've worked to, once they get to that level, a dollar is a, it is all the principle of it. It has nothing to do with the, um, it, it has nothing to do with the scale and has nothing to do with the money. It's the principle of the money. So a dollar, a hundred dollars, a thousand dollars, a hundred million dollars. It is all the principle of it. And that is the experience of dealing with a, a, a billionaire. There is no, there's no sense of, hey, what does this really matter to me? I just want to get it closed, you know, $50,000 in closing fees. We'll eat it. Let's just get this deal going, right? Closing fees, legal, um, um, you know, there's no hide the sausage at all. And they, they fight as if this was the last deal on earth, every deal. So that's my experience. When you go up in dollars, it becomes the principal. And then every dollar matters a lot more than if you and I were doing a deal. There's probably a fear of not remaining disciplined and oh, because I have the money, I'm gonna oh, get yeah. sloppy, right? A a absolutely. You know, if you or I were doing a deal, we more wanna do the deal. So in my experience, I'm like, hey guys, I'll eat the legal and you guys go, we'll eat the diligence and if it's not equal, we'll figure it out on the next deal. Let's get this one closed, see if we like working together. If the work we do together is good, right? And if we can, you know, continue to work together and make deals happen, I'll eat this, you eat that, it'll come out in the wash, let's move forward. Because we want to do the deal more than we want the discipline of every last dollar. That's the way we would do a deal. But a billionaire does not have that sensibility. It's amazing to be a billionaire though, isn't it? It's, it's really amazing because usually you want to leave a little meat on the bone for the next deal and say, but I guess, I guess, hey, he's the billionaire and I'm not, so. Well, you know, by, by contrast, um, I think, you know, the same guys who tell me, look, don't, don't be greedy, right? Because I say, hey, I can sell this for more. Mm -hmm. And that, you know what, leave it on the bone, let everybody make some money. I go, yeah, but I can sell this, you know, at another, you know, we can put another 5% load on it. We'll make another million four, right? And so they'll let that million four go like that. And then we're in closing and he's like, what's this $25,000? Yes. I'm like, this is no, legal. We agreed to eat it. <laughs> we're not eating legal. Why should we eat legal? Well, we're fucking walking. We're out of here. <laughs> dollar deal. I mean, you just said, who gives a fuck about $1.4 million? And now you're grinding my ass for a week on $25,000. I'm completely lost. And you're eating shitty Chinese food, bro, instead of having like $20 pieces yeah. of sushi, right? That's so what the, I don't understand, bro. The land of a billionaire is upside down land. That's what you can, <laughs> that's what you can tell yourself. Uh, so Stenzi, how, how are you going to, we got, now we got billionaires, we got crappy Chinese food. What else you want to put on the, uh, on the, uh, next time, next time I have to go. I'm, I'm okay. two minutes over my next call. See, and this, he's Orin. setting us up right now, man. He's anyway, setting everybody. Up, this is he, and he's going to tell us to fuck off right now. Gina. Yeah. Right. Hey, you know what? <laughs> fuck off. Don't buy flip the script. Okay. All right. Can't pitch anything. Okay. <laughs> or appreciate you, your time today, man. Just when you think, you know, the answer, I changed the question. <laughs> Bye guys. Bye guys. Thanks. Guys. Thanks. Bye. Is your money working as hard as you are? At Ram Partners, we partner with hardworking investors who are seeking true passive income through multifamily real estate. Partnering with RAND means transparent communication with our webinars, monthly statements, and newsletters. For more information, visit rampartners.com to register for our investor portal and to set up a call with our team.